Sasquatch, Woodbooger, Skunk Ape, Momo, Googly, Grassman, Patty, the World Hide and Seek Champion, the Missing Link, the King of the Cryptids, Bigfoot. Bigfoot is beyond any shadow of a doubt the most famous cryptid to walk the earth. None of his peers even approach the American Ape Man in terms of pop cultural presence, photographic and video evidence, or the amount of effort dedicated to finding them. But how did the paranormal primate from the Pacific Northwest attain this privileged position? Well, start roasting yourself some marshmallows and gather around the campfire, because you're about to find out. Now, tales of hairy giants that live in the woods have been around for a long time, and come from all over the world. What we call Bigfoot in North America is known as the Yaren in China, the Yaoi in Australia, the Hibigone in Japan, the Amphirlioth Moor in Scotland, and the Yeti in the Himalayas, just to give a few examples. In North America, native tribes spanning the entire continent have various stories about what we now call Bigfoot. Stories that go back for centuries and predate the written word in those cultures. These encounters were passed down through the oral traditions of the various tribes that inhabited North America. These retellings of encounters with giant, hairy men that lived in the forest abounded, and descriptions of their behavior varied from tribe to tribe. Some saw them as non-aggressive beings and even trading partners in a few instances, while others reported them as being a reason to not go out after dark. Now, if you're interested in history, you might already know that Christopher Columbus was in fact not the first European to discover the Americas, with Leif Erikson beating him by several centuries. What you might not find in too many history books is that Erikson may also have been the first Bigfoot eyewitness that didn't call North America home. The famous Viking was on a voyage to Vinland, what we now call North America, in 986 AC, when he and his men encountered extremely large, hairy creatures that they called Skellrings, which roughly translates to barbarian. This has led to speculation from some Bigfoot researchers that the entities they saw that were large and hairy enough for little Vikings to make a note of it may in fact have been Sasquatches. Stories about encounters between the early European settlers in the New World and the North American Nightmare aren't what I would exactly call easy to come by, but they do exist. One of the most interesting tales to come out of these sightings is the end of the Genosqua. The Genosqua were said to be a type of Sasquatch that were unusually aggressive towards humans and would guard themselves from any threat of retribution by rolling around in the mud, which would then harden, protecting them from arrows. This defense proved so effective that the name Genosqua actually translates to stone giant in a testament to their seemingly impenetrable hides. However, the keyword there is seemingly. There's a reason Genosqua sightings aren't reported today, and that reason is a wonderful example of cultural diffusion. A Chinese invention known as the musket, being wielded by European settlers in North America. The sheer power that these weapons could produce, that the Genosqua's mud caking did little more than slow them down against their opposition. And that was the end of the stone giants. Now, something you may not know is that the paranormal primate actually went by Sasquatch before he went by Bigfoot. To be even more precise, the word Sasquatch is something of an anglicization of the word Sasquates, which was the Coast Salish people's term for these creatures. The word Sasquatch was coined in the 1930s by a man named John Walter Burns. Burns worked as what was essentially a representative of the Canadian government within the country's First Nation reserves, the Chehalis Reserve specifically in this case, to enforce government policies and manage day-to-day -day affairs, as well as acting as a school teacher to the youth on the reserve. During his time in this position, Burns developed a friendship with local medicine man named Frank Dan. Now, the Chehalis people at the time were very hesitant about sharing some of their seemingly impossible stories with outsiders, but the friendship between Dan and Burns eventually grew to a point where Dan felt comfortable sharing some of his tribe's secrets. What piqued Burns' interest the most were the reports of hairy giants, which Burns eventually compiled and then published in Maclean's magazine. These stories were the first instance of the word Sasquatch being put in writing, although it's not entirely clear as to whether Sasquatch was what some of the natives had once called these people, or if it was just an invention of J.W. Burns. What I'm showing on screen right now is called an engram viewer, which essentially tracks usage of certain words over time, 
in this case the word Bigfoot from 1800 to 2019, which is the most recent year available as of this video being made. Now the first usages of the word Bigfoot shown here weren't actually in reference to the humongous hairy hominid that we all know and love. I can't tell you precisely what caused this slight uptick in the 1840s, but my best guess for the increase in use of the word in the 1880s is in reference to the unincorporated community of Bigfoot, Texas, which came to the name in 1883. The word Bigfoot began being used to refer to these creatures in 1958, when a group of loggers in Bluff Creek, California, found an enormous set of tracks in the dirt near their work site. They had casts made by a local taxidermist, and the cast measured 16 inches long and 6 inches wide, with a 15-inch stride. The loggers experienced other strange occurrences while in the area, such as a 450-pound diesel drum and a 700-pound tire going missing, only to be found in places where the foliage surrounding them was undisturbed, suggesting that they were tossed there rather than carried, as well as four dogs going missing, prompting the workers to begin carrying firearms while on site. They went to local news about these happenings, and the Humboldt Times ran the story, dubbing whatever that created these tracks as Bigfoot. There is another twist in this story, however. Decades later, in 2002, the families of one of the workers at the site, a man named Ray Wallace, would allege that on his deathbed, he had admitted to creating the tracks himself using a pair of wooden shoes as a practical joke on his co-workers. However, the family has never produced any evidence of these claims, nor have they offered an explanation for things such as the missing dogs or the enormous pieces of equipment that were seemingly carried off and then tossed by one individual. Now, the 1958 tracks that gave Bigfoot his name wouldn't be the only time that Bluff Creek was a significant location in the history of the hairy hominid. On October 20th, 1967, one of the most famous videos on the planet would be shot in the area. The story goes that Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin were looking to shoot a mockumentary on Bigfoot, and they ended up running into the actual thing. Patterson chose Bluff Creek as a filming location due to the 1958 tracks, and the area having history of reported Sasquatch activity. The fact that they were planning to shoot a movie proved to be an incredible stroke of good luck, as it meant that the two had a professional-grade camera with which to capture their famous footage. According to Patterson and Gimlin, the pair was riding on horseback through Bluff Creek at around 1.30 p.m. when they both noticed a figure lurking nearby. After processing the sheer shock of what they were seeing, Patterson got down from his horse so he could grab his camera and started filming the beast. He told Gimlin to grab his firearm in preparation for the worst-case scenario, and the two approached the supernatural simian. They filmed until the reel ran out, then tracked the creature until they lost in the forest. They quickly had the film developed and went to the public with one of the most significant pieces of footage in all of human history. Now, as you can see from this graph, there was an immediate increase in usage of the word Bigfoot after the footage was released to the public in 1967. Roger Patterson was quick to try and spread the word about the film. First, he tried going to the scientific community, but unfortunately found little interest for the most part. His attempts at reaching the layman, however, proved to be more fruitful. He made the rounds on various talk shows at the time, which is what led to the popularity of the film, and ultimately Bigfoot himself. In fact, today the Patterson-Gimlin film is the second most analyzed piece of video in human history, only surpassed by the Zapruder film showing the Kennedy assassination. A few have come out over the years claiming that Patty was really just them in a suit, but not a single one has been able to produce something even resembling the creature in the film. Now, there is an urban legend floating around that on his deathbed, Patterson said that he had hoaxed the footage and Patty really was just a man in a suit. This is not the case at all, and I think it's a case of details getting confused from a few different stories and them having had a game of telephone played over a few decades. The first is that a few days prior to his death, Patterson admitted wishing that he had just shot the creatures that had a body to show in Quiet Skeptics. The second true story that got mixed in is frankly strange even for our subject matter, and that's the tale of the fake Bob Gimlin. While Patterson was eager to make the rounds on the convention circuit, Gimlin was a lot more hesitant. Patterson's solution to this problem? Just hire someone to pretend to be Bob Gimlin. Now, there was one small flaw in this plan. 
uh, that flaw being that people have eyes. Some of Gimlin's friends realized that the man Patterson was claiming was Bob Gimlin. It wasn't Bob Gimlin they knew, and they told him what was going on, leading to tension between Patterson and Gimlin. Patterson owned up to this and apologized to Gimlin while on his deathbed, and the two ultimately reconciled. I would like to note that in the years between filming the famous video and his death, Roger Patterson remained an avid Bigfoot hunter, which I think would be at least a little strange for a hoaxer. And even to this day, Bob Gimlin still holds to that what he saw was real, and if there was a hoax, well, he had no part in it. Now, as you can see here, during the mid to late 70s, there was an absolute explosion in usage of the word Sasquatch, just for it to quickly die down once the 80s began. I haven't been able to find a definitive answer for why this was, but I've found a few potential causes. Now, the aforementioned Patty film no doubt contributed to the boom. The video quickly spread across the country and went viral before going viral was even an actual thing. However, the Patterson-Gimlin footage was shot in 1967. The Sasquatch boom didn't start until 10 years later. While the Patty film was a major cause of the 70s Sasquatch boom, it seems unlikely that it was the sole cause. What I think is rather interesting is there seems to be a bit of a chicken or the egg situation as to what drove interest in Sasquatch during this time. There was definitely an uptick in the amount of Bigfoot-related media projects with television programs, such as Bigfoot and Wild Boy, an episode of Leonard Nimoy's In Search Of focused on the Harry Hominid, multiple appearances on The Six Million Dollar Man, being played by Andre the Giant and Ted Cassidy, who also played Lurch in The Addams Family. Films like The Legend of Boggy Creek from 1972, which focused on the folk monster of Arkansas, Sasquatch Legend of Bigfoot from 1976, and Creature from Black Lake, which was released the same year. The question is, was it these projects that drove attention to Bigfoot, or were they produced in response to the increased interest in the anomalous ape? My personal theory would have to be that it was the Patty Films publicity tour that drove the initial interest in creating various documentaries and non-fiction TV specials that created interest, which then led to the demand for creation of the fictional works I've listed. You'll notice a similar, albeit less steep, increase in interest beginning in the late 80s, which I would attribute to the film Harry and the Hendersons from 1987, making $50 million at the box office. About 136 million bucks in 2023 dollars. In the 1990s, another piece of footage was released that some consider a runner-up to the Patty film in the Bigfoot video rankings, that being the Freeman footage. The Freeman footage was shot near the Blue Mountains region of Oregon in 1994 by a gentleman named Paul Freeman, thus the name, the Freeman footage. The video shows what appears to be a Bigfoot crossing through the woods in front of Freeman. It's a solid piece of evidence, with most opinions in the Bigfoot community ranging from authentic but worst inconclusive, with very few screaming hoax. As you can see on the graph, there was an immediate spike in the usage of the word Sasquatch after this footage was released, and within a decade, usage of the word once again matched the previous all-time highs of the 1970s. I believe that this spike can be at least partially attributed to the film being one of the better pieces of Bigfoot video evidence that's out there. In the years since the release of the Freeman footage, new footage has come out potentially showing the American Ape Man. This clip shot in Provo Canyon, Utah in 2012, the Mississippi Skunk Cape footage from 2014, and even a Journey to the Other Side exclusive video that came out of Southern California back in late 2020. While none of these videos have reached the same level of fame as, say, the Patty film, or even the Freeman footage, they do help to further the argument for the big guy's existence as well as push Sasquatch further into the mainstream when they go viral online. These clips have been discussed at length and even featured on various television programs, such as the History Channel's The Proof Is Out There, and some of them might just be the real deal. Although I may be just a touch biased there. Now, in a similar vein to the Engram graphs from earlier, this is a graph of the relative rate of Google searches about Bigfoot going back to 2004. As you might notice, Google searches about Bigfoot absolutely skyrocketed to the point of hitting an all-time peak back in August of 2008. This was due to a pair of hikers named Matthew Witten and Rick Dyer claiming that they had recovered the body of a genuine Bigfoot and were keeping the body in a freezer in Georgia. This obviously created a massive amount of interest in the topic of Bigfoot and swiftly gained mainstream media attention with photos being released online and the duo even going so far as claiming that they collected DNA from the alleged creature. 
Now, so I'm sure you can all guess, based on the fact that this video is being made 15 years later, and we still don't have a physical specimen, their claims were unfortunately completely made up, and what they actually had was not a Bigfoot, but instead a rubber gorilla suit stored in a freezer. News outlets reported the find to be a hoax, as quickly as they reported it to be legitimate, and the world kept spinning, not any closer to finding Bigfoot than it was before the two men's made-up claims. I'll take a break from describing the rise of Bigfoot to discuss the rise of something far more bizarre and unnatural, reality television. Back in 2007, the Writers Guild of America went on strike, making producing new television programs far more difficult than it was in years prior. To circumvent this problem, networks turned to a form of programming that wouldn't require writers, reality television. The, in theory, unscripted nature of these productions means that they can be made very cheaply and very quickly, and are wholly immune to any future writer strikes. Bigfoot's rise has been helped in part by the number of shows that have the premise of finding the bipedal beast. While none of these programs have actually managed to locate the fearsome porous figure, and frankly I doubt if they did, they would wait until their release date to tell us, they do help the topic of Bigfoot to gain more mainstream attention, albeit not necessarily always the positive type. Finding Bigfoot, $10 million Bigfoot Bounty, and Expedition Bigfoot are just a few examples of the shows bringing the hunt for the world hide-and-seek champion into the living rooms of millions of everyday Americans. The quick spike in use of the word Sasquatch following a slight dip in 2006 I think might also be attributable to a different part of the world of TV, that being the world of commercials. As 2006 was when Jack Link's Beef Jerky started featuring the fearsome forest dwellers in an advertising campaign. In November of 2012, a Texas veterinarian by the name of Melba Ketchum made one of the wildest claims in the history of the search for the Squatch, that she had not only recovered a sample of Bigfoot's DNA, but that she had been able to sequence its genome. In Ketchum's own words, our data indicates that the North American Sasquatch is a hybrid species, the result of males of an unknown hominin species crossing with female homo sapiens. She said that the unknown hominin species interbred with human women about 13,000 years ago. These claims quickly hit the media, and as you can see from the graph, there was a significant uptick in searches for Bigfoot at this time. While the media was quick to latch onto this story, the scientific community was much more hesitant, with no academic journals publishing Ketchum's findings. Ultimately, a peer review of the hair samples used for the purported Bigfoot DNA couldn't prove that they were taken from anything other than brown bears, and the study was quickly forgotten by the public at large. I believe that there's also something to be said for the creation of the internet driving more interest in Bigfoot than ever before, as you can see from the exponential increase in the usage of the word around the time that the information superhighway became more mainstream. First of all, the internet connecting more people than at any point in previous history not only means that information on these creatures is pretty much always readily available, it also means that new pieces of potential Sasquatch evidence can spread extremely quickly, for good or for ill. Social media platforms such as YouTube and TikTok allow new videos of the American Ape Man to reach an audience that Sasquatch researchers of yesteryear could really only dream of. This isn't the only way the rise of the internet has also led to the rise of Bigfoot. Despite my best efforts, only 13% of American adults even believe in Bigfoot, per the most recent survey I could find. This means that if you get eight Joe six-packs in a room, odds are only one of them will actually believe in the Lumberland legend. As a consequence of this, a lot of people that have had encounters are going to be very hesitant to come forward about them. The ability to stay anonymous that is afforded by the internet means these people can share what they've seen without fear of being perceived as off their rocker by their peers. Being able to coordinate groups of Bigfoot eyewitnesses, hunters, researchers, and enthusiasts from across the country also means that people can share their experiences more easily with like-minded peers and give us a more accurate depiction of what these things that people are reporting really are. Personally, I think the biggest benefit of the internet to the Bigfoot community it's just letting people that have seen these things know that they aren't crazy, and they're not alone in what they've experienced. As for the future of Bigfoot, only time will tell what lies in store for the Timberland Titan. We have yet to find proof that will satisfy even the most ardent of skeptics. 
but the truth can't stay hidden forever. So grab some friends, the best camera you can get your hands on, and a state attorney to make sure your last will and testament are in order. And then it's happy hunting. I wish you all the best.